Many organizations struggle with decision making. As the environment becomes more volatile, they can't make good decisions fast enough. Decision making is actually one of the pillars of agility, which can be defined as the ability to respond and anticipate better and faster at all levels of the organization. Decision making, and more specifically, accelerating decisions, provides a leverage to change the organization, to make it more agile. Because as we accelerate decisions, we also encourage and propagate agile values and behaviors to the whole organization. When I speak about decision making here, I'm not referring only to executives making strategic decisions. Decision making, just like leadership, is not associated to a specific level in the organization. It's pervasive. It is what makes it complicated to change, but I assume what makes it powerful and transformational when it can be changed. Two years ago, Mary joined the company as VP of Marketing. The company is an ISP, Internet Service Provider. Pretty stable business in a pretty stable market, local market, but it's changing. Mary believes that maybe the best possible source for future growth would be to invest in big data because the company is sitting on a heap of information that they could use internally but also monetize externally. Michael, VP of Finance, has very different views. He's pretty sure that the way to go is to invest big bucks on an ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planning, like SAP for example, because that would allow to have the right numbers faster and to reduce the cost of labor in finance and accounting. And there are seven other VPs, senior directors, that gather approximately every month to decide where to invest the money. They go through tens, hundreds of slides. Each has their few pet projects that they're pushing, pushing forward. And of course, each of these initiatives has a wonderful business case supporting it. Always very profitable. But we understand pretty well, and Mary understands pretty well that, of course, these business cases are not very objective. And because there are not so many guidelines of how to select investments, it's all about negotiation and talking, power, politics. At the end of the day, because these are nice people, they don't want conflicts. So at the end of the day, everyone has a little bit of something, but very few real decisions are made there. And Mary is quite frustrated. Fast forward seven months. Mary's initiative, Big Data, didn't get much farther. They agreed on an analysis that might lead to decisions. But overall, nothing is really moving. Still pretty stable, pretty slow. Mary, though, feels that the market is changing. Competitors are moving. There is talk of new regulation. And customer expectations are changing. However, none of this information from the environment is really taken into account seriously in decision making. It's just business as usual, like it has been for many years. However, the company has become very good at one thing, reacting to crisis. For example, two months ago, a competitor undercut prices on the student segment, which is an important segment for the company. And right away, they did something about it. Marketing, IT, everything. But Mary notices that more and more time and energy is dedicated to reacting to crisis and less and less to anticipate, to take the lead. And this is clearly a virtual circle. It doesn't bode very well for the future. Mary wonders how to change the way people make decisions there, to deal with that, to take into account that the world of today and tomorrow is changing much faster than just a few years ago. And life continues at the company. Unfortunately, decision making doesn't really improve. Until one day, a Monday morning, Mary drives her daughter to school. And when it's time to kiss goodbye, her seven-year daughter gets her finger caught in the door. Oosh, that hurts a lot. And little girl cries a lot and her hand swells 
So Mary decides to go to the emergency at the hospital. And when they get there, she waits for five, ten minutes with a little girl crying until a nurse calls them in. And she looks at the little girl, asks a few questions, apparently routine, performs a few checks, and then she says, you know, kids this age, they're quite resilient to this type of injuries. Nothing serious. Your priority is six. So Mary asks her, but what's priority six? Uh, it's actually the lowest priority here. So you might have to wait for a long time. I suggest you to just go home. Very likely, you will go away, heal by itself. And if it doesn't, in a few days, maybe you can go to a regular clinic. This is not an emergency. So Mary is at the same time relieved and frustrated. And uh, she goes to the hospital cafeteria and offers her little girl hot chocolate because this is always good medicine, right? And she can't help thinking, making the parallel between what she just lived, the triage system in the hospital, and the challenges they meet at work to make decisions efficiently. Are there not things that they can reuse? Why is it so easy here and so difficult at the job, at work? Let's look at what happened. They came in. Anyone can come in. Because anyone can be injured, not just VPs or directors. Just like for IDs in business. Anyone can have good IDs. And then they are screened quickly, efficiently, based on a few objective criteria with discipline. Before they can separate what's important, what's less important, and focus their energy on limited resources. And finally, there is the courage, because sometimes they just have to say no. And sometimes they say no to a little girl crying. It's not hard to do, right? It is hard to do, but it should be much easier to do at the company. On the way back to the car, she meets with the nurse in the corridor, and she asks her, oh, it's an interesting system that you have here. We might use it at work. Unfortunately, it seems to work mostly for reaction. The nurse's answer is, no, not at all. There is a lot of things we can anticipate. You don't see that when you come in as a patient. But actually, we can anticipate the number of injuries, the type of injuries, based on the weekdays, weekends, summer, winter, trending sports, or medication. And we feed this information to other parts of the health system that can have take proactive actions. So this takes a whole new dimension in Mary's mind. And she's convinced there is something to learn there, something to apply in the company. So the next day, back to work, and indeed her daughter's finger gets better, back to work, and she decides to give it a try. So she writes down on one page, because it's very simple, what a triage system would look like for, for the company. And she goes to all people involved in decision making, which is pretty much everyone. Not just VPs or directors, right? And everyone says, yes, this makes sense. Who would be against such an ID? So she starts implementing it. And number of IDs, requests, initiatives, demands get into the system. After a few months, she's moderately happy, but still, something's annoying her. There are a lot of exceptions. Exceptions for not going to the system. For example, big initiatives don't go in because it is, she doesn't know why, supposed to be for small ones. And critical initiatives don't go through it because it's new, you know. And also finance things for some reason she doesn't understand don't go into the system either. So she goes and sees people who use the system and don't play with the system to better understand. And unfortunately, she's very disappointed about what she hears because ultimately, Nothing has changed. People use a the system. They use it because they think that their own demand will be better served by this system, this new triage system, than by other systems like the previous one. So it's still the same problem as before. Everyone is playing for oneself. And Mary realizes that it's not a question of system. Yes, it helps, but ultimately, it's the company's culture the people's values 
they don't play together. They have to learn to collaborate. They have to trust each other. They have to have a shared vision, shared purpose. And then such a system can work. And she understands it's a chicken and egg problem. You need a system to get it started. But you can't really achieve the system's benefits without changing the cultural enablers. And so she decides to put people together and to get them to a shared vision together, identify challenges, how actions can be done in each functional silo, transversally, in the organization, to reach these objectives. And by doing that, people gain trust in each other, they understand each other's point of view, and then the system starts to work. It gathers momentum, and decision-making is getting better and accelerated. And through that, the values start changing the organization. The organization becomes more agile, at large. But it takes a long, long time. And all that, this cultural enabler, is mostly done through conversations, the right conversations with the right people. This is what gets it started. The principle is simple, but the practice is not. And so it takes a lot of courage. Because this is not a typical action organization. This diagram summarizes the elements we have seen in our story. I'd like to bring a few points to your attention. The first one is that whether you are trying to accelerate decision making or you want to do a full scale or judge transformation, you have to remember that it has to fit in a business context. We don't do a job for a job, we do it for business reasons. In our story, Slow decision-making had a number of very negative business consequences. And Mary, in a story, looked at what she could improve in the organization, in her company, to, to deal with that. She got inspiration from the triage system in a hospital emergency room. But she could have gone somewhere else, like a job portfolio management or dynamic prioritization to get inspiration. The point here is that the process or system part of the solution, it's only a small part of the solution. As we have noticed, the most important part is cultural. I uh, list here a few of the cultural enablers that can help make such a system effective. The system and the cultural enablers are codependent. Usually, we cannot act on culture directly. We need something to put people in action so they discover the right behaviors and culture starts to change. But the system, system itself cannot succeed alone either because you need the culture enablers to support it or else people will find loopholes and we use it in the wrong way. It's just a vehicle. It has to be driven in the right direction. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and uh, if you are interested in discussing about that, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm always interested in meeting with people who have passion for agility. Thank you.